So we have the, the board here is probably could look like it's in a foreign language in a lot of ways. But um, what we have is, in general astrology, a lot of people will say, you know, um, it doesn't really fit. It's, you know, it, it, there's all these generalizations about it. And the thing is, is that we're made up of more than just our sun sign. And to really know your personality and your essence, it takes knowing your time of birth, where you were born, and then really finding your chart. Because each of us, even though we have lots of Sagittarians in the room, if we really sat and talked to you, there would probably be a common thread that runs in your essence, but your lives would be very different. And we may have, because fire signs, Sagittarius is a fire sign, are known to be a little bit more outgoing and not so shy, but one of you or more of you that are Sag might think that you are shy. And it could be because of your rising sign or your moon. And that came up, we were talking about um, the particulars of it. So what we're gonna do tonight though is we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about the, the pure essence of Sagittarius. So it would be somebody who's really Sag, Sag rising, Sag moon, if in their personality, or like we were talking about, the essence of the energy that is coming in today. Because as a matter of fact, the sun actually changed from Scorpio to Sagittarius today. For some of us, it is like a national holiday. <laughs> but, because um, Sagittarius, and I'm gonna talk about um, the difference between that and Scorpio. So, the sun moved into Sagittarius this morning. And it'll stay there until December 20th this year. And we, um, and then on the 21st, are going to Capricorn. So every year, we have at this time the opportunity to experience the Sagittarian energy. So we go through all 12 signs. What it gives us is the opportunity to actually experience that energy, to work with it in our lives. For some of it, it may be more comfortable. For the Sages in the room, it might feel very comfortable because it's considered their season. Whenever we're in our birthday month, it's like our season. So for some of us, it can feel very comfortable. For the fire signs, that usually works out pretty well around their birthday. For the earth signs, sometimes it is not the case around their birthdays. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, so uh, there are, what I'd like to point out is that there are different ways to look at astrology. There's personality astrology where you have your chart done. And I would tell you about how your emotions work, how you deal with people, all of, all of that. What we're really talking about tonight is called esoteric, some, in some respects it's called soul astrology. And what we study in that is the fact that this is the astrological wheel. It starts with Aries in March. And then it goes all the way around through every sign. So right now, here we are in November, December, and we're coming back this way. And um, so we hit all of the signs. In esoteric astrology, what we're talking about is the way that the soul progresses through each sign. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're a Sag, that you started in Aries and you're on your ninth time around. It just means that basically in this lifetime, this, what is going on with Sagittarius, that essence of Sagittarius, is what is most important to your soul for its development right now. And um, so and it doesn't mean, oh my God, I only have three lives left. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that at, at all. But so what the way we're looking at it tonight is the essence of Sagittarius how we develop our soul and what we can learn at this time of the year. <clears throat> so, and I'm, we're going to do a separate workshop um, soon here, but basically with Sagittarius, there are four elements to astrology. Sagittarius is one of the three fire signs. So their mode of action is to be more outward. They're doers, not necessarily um, 
wanting to sit still, but there's this oomph. I mean, that's why they have the symbol of fire. There's a fieriness to them. Um, and so that's, that's their element. They are joined by Aries and Leo. So in the Aries and Leo season, we can definitely tell that there's more of an outward emphasis to what we're doing in our life. Then the other elements are air, earth, and water. So people always like to know who they're most compatible with. So making a generalization, the fire signs are very compatible with the other two fire signs, Aries and Leo, and then with the air signs, Aquarius, Gemini, and Libra. If you're partnered with something other than that, don't freak out. But it's just that that can be a generalization that fire and air go together and air and fire go together. So Sagittarius comes in in a very interesting time of the year. I've always wondered about the fact that we are, it's the last season, it's the, it, yeah, it's the last season of fall and we're getting ready to go into winter. And so we have this fire sign in what in our um, hemisphere can be one of the coldest times of the year. As we just saw, we had almost winter weather this past week. So, but we have this fire sign there. Um, Sagittarius, interestingly, is, so some generalizations about it. It's generous, it's jovial, it likes to laugh, great sense of humor. Um, it is a very spiritual side to it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be religious, but there is definitely a looking to the deeper meanings of life in its quest. It can be vast and inspirational. It can see the larger issues at hand. It's very generous. It, it can be a great teacher and judge, straightforward and bold. But at the same time, it can have a real issue with regulating its mind. It can tend to be a little bit on the side of exaggeration. Never satisfied. Can be a little loud. Sometimes Sagittarius can be a little coarse. There's a generalization about Sagittarius as always kind of putting their foot in their mouth, like saying the saying something just not quite. It's it's the truth because that is a major element of Sagittarius. It's truth. Of all of the signs, they have the hardest time lying. It'll show on their face. It just doesn't happen. All of a sudden, they just instantly show the fact that they are not able to um, hold that non-truth in their essence, and they'll fess up, or it just it's a mess for them. So in, you can see that that can be kind of really appealing if you have an essence that's fiery, warm, and truth is very important to them. Um, it's concerned a lot with, so when we say that it rules certain things, it rules like long journeys. It, it rules like learning about other cultures. It has a spiritual vision. It has this sense of expansion to it. Um, I think that it's, and Sagittarius has this sense of being thankful and grateful. So we have Thanksgiving in the middle of the, of the season. So I like this because it kind of shows every sign has its dark and its light side, which what we're always trying to do in our life is bring all of it together. Rather than denying one side or the other, we're trying to bring it together. So with Sagittarius, we have this sense of expansion the sense of spirit, the sense of being grateful for what they have, and learning. And when, when they learn, they're very excited to you know, tell somebody else about it. But the sense of expansion and the sense of gratitude. So we have Thanksgiving, which that's what that's about. It's about being grateful. It's about this whole essence of really um, coming together and 
like a sense of brotherhood and celebrating and sharing. But also think about what we hear about the holiday here is it's, oh man, I'm gonna pay out. I'm going to really, you know, just eat everything I want to on Thanksgiving. It's expansion, right? In, in that essence at the same time. So we can always look at it, it's like, so how does the expansion lean? You know, which way are we looking at the holiday? Gratitude or just bring it on? I also think that it's interesting that the Christmas season really takes place under Sagittarius because the holiday is just a few days basically into Capricorn, which is a totally different energy, which we'll talk about next month. But it's like, so, you know, we say, well, Christmas um, is culturally is really the buildup is about spending money, making things bright, you know, decorating and having all these parties and we overextend ourselves in so many ways. And we go out and we do all this stuff and we're just like expanding, 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 expanding. And that's all the Christmas season that takes place in Sagittarius. And then once we get to Christmas, so many of us then get a cold or the flu or we're exhausted on Christmas Day. We can't believe how depleted we are because then we've moved into Capricorn and that energy is much more of a constricted pulling in and needing structure. So our whole, the culture around consumerism is Sagittarius. But then if you are celebrating the spiritual part of Christmas, that can also be very much about what Sagittarius offers because we're also looking for higher philosophy and the meaning of life. So I talked about Sagittarius, the label that in esoteric astrology that they give it is the spiritual aspirant. So the, the person seeking spirituality. So we have gone around some of this wheel uh, in these classes. And it doesn't matter if you don't, if we haven't seen or experienced them at all. But the thing is that we started off as a baby because we were talking about the evolution of the soul. We started off as a baby and then through each of these signs, we learned all of these personal things. So I am, I have, I communicate, I feel, I create, I will, I serve, I'm in relation. Um, you know, uh, okay, so we have them all over here. I desire, and then we get to Sagittarius and it's like, I perceive. And there's like this pause of all of this personal stuff of I feel, I have, I am. And then we start to, we, we've started to move up. And in Scorpio, we were really digging down towards I desire and then in Sagittarius, we're perceiving. So it, an interesting point with Sagittarius is we have a fire sign that is sandwiched in between what they say in astrology are some of the most intense signs of the zodiac. So we have Scorpio and we have Capricorn. So very quickly, last time what we learned about in Scorpio, and you may have Scorpio friends, or you may feel yourself coming out of this, where it's a little heavier because Scorpio, in Scorpio, we learn to dig deep into the really dark, murky waters, find out the dark parts of us, or go into our dark cave and pull out the things that, that we're afraid of. Or going into the swamp, as the story went, and pulling up all of the stuff that maybe doesn't feel good, but we realize that the more we pull it up, the more we look at it, the more we bring it into the light of the day, the freer we are. That's where Sagittarius comes in. Sagittarius says, I've come out of the swamp. Wow, that was intense. But here I am on the plane because we go from the swamp to this expansive plane that's open far and wide in front of us. And that's what Sagittarius sees, is all this space. Now they see a mountain up ahead and they're like, I can get there because the space between the swamp I just climbed out of and that mountain over there is wide open. 
So that is kind of the essence of what we're tapping into right now in Sagittarius. It's like, I'm, I'm free and it gives me the opportunity to be able to move forward in my life. And we can do that in many ways, but especially doing that on a spiritual quest, it's like, this is cool. Being careful though, of the fact of, I'm free, wow, didn't I do a great job? I was fantastic taking care of that snake, wasn't I? Woo! And all this like super ego stuff that can come with it. So that's one of the pitfalls that the Sag has to kind of be careful of. Because it's a fire sign, there is this sense of warmth and ego and wanting to be a little, everything just a little bit bigger and brighter. There's nothing wrong with that, but grounded in the truth, you know? Grounded in reality somehow. That can be a hard thing for our Sagittarius who, and a lot of Sagittariuses, they actually almost look like they're walking on their toes in a physical sense. Sometimes you can tell a Sagittarius because they will physically walk like this, or they have a, an intense buoyancy to them. So he's come out of the swamp, he or she, and walking across the plain, sees the mountain. That's next month. That's what we have in Capricorn, is where the mountain starts to get climbed by the mountain goat. But the Sagittarius is actually represented by the archer. That is the symbol. So we had, we had several um, representations for Scorpio, and they mostly crawled on the ground until they learned to fly. But when he comes out here, and he comes out, he's got this big, vast plane ahead of him, and he is actually a centaur. In case you don't know what that is, in mythology it is a being that is half horse, and then the human torso. So he has this horse's body and the torso of a human being. So it can move across this plane pretty quickly. And it seems that the centaur, its um, weapon, just in case it needs something to help it out here, is a bow and arrow. So they're experts with the bow and arrow. So when you look at a chart, or in this, the glyph here that you see, since we don't put up all the other figures, is it's the arrow. So we have this symbolism of the centaur with the bow and arrow as his as his weapon or as his gift that he has, because he's not necessarily always using it as a weapon, but he's, he's looking up and out. There's, we've left the darkness down here, so the Sagittarius is now going, wow, that's cool, that's really cool. And things that are out there, the stars, those things that glitter, that have meaning, unlike in Gemini, where it can just be things just spread out. But Sagittarius is actually looking up at the stars, and it shoots its arrow. And so the other thing that Sag needs to keep in mind is that it's great to have a magic arrow, and you get a whole backpack of them, and you can just keep pulling them out and pulling them out and pulling them out and just sending them off. And that you have so many ideas, and this can happen in the Sagittarius energy that we're going through right now this month. So just see if you might see this as a focus. All the glitters may catch your eyes. Oh yeah, I want to go to all of these parties. Oh, I want to do all of this. Oh, I've got all these great ideas. I want blah, 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 blah. Sagittarius has to learn to figure out what is it that I really want to shoot my arrow, or a handful of them, rather than all of these thousands of arrows that I have. How can I focus my attention into at least an area of one or two? And that can be a big thing for a Sagittarian in general for their life. And we can feel that in this time period that's coming up, is how do we focus? So we're always given the ways to make those things happen in our sign, in our energy. So keeping in mind in esoteric astrology, the earth, which sometimes we forget that it's in here because we don't talk about it too much in astrology, 
because we're on it, is actually the ruler of, Sag of, yeah, of Sagittarius and the esoteric form. Jupiter is its regular ruling planet, and Jupiter is all about expansion. If you came to me for your chart and you're like, I just want to hear good things, I'd tell you all about Jupiter. Because Jupiter is that essence of Sag, that out there and big and expansion, you know, and you look for where Jupiter is in your chart when you want to know something about expanding. So it has Earth, and you think of the element of Earth beneath our feet, right underneath all four of its hooks. So the horse body is a really interesting symbol for the Sagittarian. Because this part of it, the man part, has the bow and arrow. And it's ready to shoot its arrows all over the place. So much so that it forgets to look down and can trip. It forgets that it has this grounded horse body. And it has the capability of actually putting its feet on the ground and figuring out what it's going to do. And that, going beyond just the season, those are the Sagittarians that are going to make that make huge impact in all of our lives. Because their sense of being able to see philosophy into a bigger picture, that huge picture of how things work, they have that sense of the truth and seeing it. As long as they don't become so narrow that only their truth is the way. But actually keeping that sense of expansion, allowing themselves to feel the earth beneath their feet. So this season that we're going into is very up. It, it, it has a sense of spirit to it. So when we say that Christmas and Hanukkah and all that fall under this, it's because there's this sense of spirit and wanting there to be something bigger, the bigger picture in our life. When we think of philosophy, or the philosopher, we think of Sagittarius and making these big journeys and helping us all to think in a wider frame of mind. We have his symbol of the centaur. And the centaur is also an expert archer. And he can use his bow and arrow and his arrows in a lot of different ways. But his sense, especially moving as he starts to move closer to the mountain, is to become more focused and to know where his arrows need to fly, where they need to go. And so we have to be able to find what it is that we want to let loose on. So there's one more essence to this before we move into our class that I think is, um, for me, was something I learned a lot about um, in researching this. Taking the view of the centaur a step further. So we have this sense of big philosophy, big spirituality, the big picture of things, getting so lost in the heavens that we forget that we are part of earth. So um, the symbol of, of a particular centaur, and it is a, um, it's, uh, his name is Chiron. So Chiron is also, um, some people say it's a planet, some people say it's an asteroid, but there is an energy, it was discovered in 1977. And some people say that actually it should be a planet and it should actually be the ruler of Sagittarius. Interestingly, Chiron's symbol is um, the centaur because Chiron was the king of the centaurs. So we had this huge group of these horsemen, literally, and they ranged anywhere from these wild beasts to these very intellectual ones. Again, just the whole spectrum. Chiron was known as the ultimate healer, the doctor. He was, he was a philosopher, he was an expert archer, um, he was just incredibly intelligent, and he lived very close to the earth. So you can see in that mythology with the centaur Chiron, 
He was living very close to the earth, so he was keeping his groundedness. And he um, taught people, he taught Hercules, he taught all these different gods, all these different ways of um, actually healing themselves. Because he had all of this great knowledge, all of it. So the story goes that at one point, you know, all the gods and goddesses, all the stories go on and they marry each other and all that. It's no different in Roman, Greek, or Hindu. They're all basically hanging out and doing these things. So he, um, he's been teaching this. He's immortal. And um, so he is, at one point, there's a, an issue. Hercules comes to visit him. And he... Uh, Hercules, they're all, all the centaurs are out except for the cook. And Hercules comes and he goes, I want some wine. He goes, you can't, we can't open the wine until all the centaurs get back. They'll be really ticked off because we all have to drink together. Hercules is like, I want some wine. They open the wine. Hercules starts to drink it. The centaurs are off in the field, but they can smell it. So they're thinking, oh my God, what's going on? Somebody's drinking our wine. So the story is that they stampede back towards the campground. Hercules hears this incredible horde coming back, not knowing what to do. He takes out his own bows and arrows, and he just starts shooting them up in the air because he's frightened, thinking that they're going to stampede him. They go all over the place, just like Sagittarius Arabs can. And the one actually wounds Chiron in the hip, which is what Sagittarius rules is the hip. So there's this injury, and Chiron who is actually Hercules' friend. Hercules is feeling very bad. They're both kind of representing the Sagittarius energy for us in this myth. He's like, so, like, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry or whatever. And Chiron, this great healer, cannot heal himself. He can't die because he's immortal. But this is a wound that he cannot figure out. He's in excruciating pain. He doesn't know what to do with the pain. He can't figure out how to get rid of it at all. So he decides that there is another god, Prometheus, who's gotten in trouble because he, act, he gave fire to the humans that he wasn't supposed to. So Zeus basically vanished into the underworld and had him chained into the underworld. But Prometheus was such a good person. It was just like he did this one little thing by giving fire away. And he gets in all this trouble. And, but the gods had said, there's one way for you to get out of the underworld. And so he, the story is that Prometheus can leave the underworld if he can get another immortal to trade places with him and give up his immortality. So in the story, Chiron, this healer who cannot heal himself, who doesn't want to live in this pain, and he sees that if he trades places with Prometheus, then the earth, the humans get Prometheus back, who is an, also a great healer. He can give up his pain, he gives up his immortality to set Prometheus free. So that essence is really where Sagittarius can be. This almost sacrificial movement towards something higher for the greater good. When they're not exaggerating, when they're not caught up in gossip and communication, when they find that they don't necessarily always need to be outward, but that they can find healing in silence. Silence is such a big essence for fire signs in general, but for Sagittarius. Because the truth they start to hold in their heart when they know it's true is best shared when asked for. So, we have this incredible sign that has all this great energy to it. It has a centaur at the center of it. It's got all these higher aspirations and looking out for the betterment of man and, and all of that. But just a few things that it needs to keep in mind. It needs to stay grounded in the earth, to actually realize that it's not really dual. It's not a dual thing at all to be part human and part 
course. Actually, it's much better than the later myths that we have of the knight who is riding the horse with his bow and arrow, who they say, get in the West, we made it into a knight that can get off of the horse because then we can get rid of desire. We can get rid of the lower nature. But in these early myths, they have it combined together, just like what we study in yoga, in Tantra, you know, where there's really no duality, that all of it is contained within us. So his lower body and his upper body become one. So it's more of an internal alchemy for him rather than him being able to just disregard the horse. He can't because that is him. He is that in this incarnation. So there's this whole playing with that part of allowing all those things to go and move and to bring in all the higher aspirations, all of it together as one being able to actually offer it out in that human form. So, now we get to move. <laughs> so we're gonna now, um,